<laughs> Richard Grace, he was like a <laughs> trigger finger. <laughs> the guy's fast. <laughs> He was fast. So we have someone new uh, joining um, Global Star Party tonight. Her name's uh, Cheyenne Smith. She's out of Tulsa and she's uh, trying to put together a mobile observatory system, you know, so it's like a oh. mm -hmm. mobile trailer kind of thing, but with an right. observatory up on top. So she's going to talk yep. a little bit about that. I thought about doing that. Yeah, she's pretty much, you know, pretty much there. She's just been um, generating funds for it and stuff like that, which she's, she's done all right with so far. That's good. Okay, who do we have here today? We've got Richard Grace and Mike Wiesner and Tarek uh, so far. How you guys doing? Scientists used supercomputer simulations to throw eight different types of stars at a monster black hole. 
Their goal is to create more realistic models of tidal disruption events, which occur when unlucky stars stray too close to black holes. Gravitational forces create intense tides that deform the stars and break them into streams of gas. These simulations are the first to combine the physical effects of Einstein's general theory of relativity and virtual stars with realistic internal structures. This schematic shows the star's trajectory. In this version of the simulations, the black hole has 1 million times the sun's mass, and the stars are about 24 million miles away at their closest. The model stars range from about 1 tenth to 10 times the sun's mass. The colors reflect their densities, from the lowest shown in blue to the highest in yellow. In some cases, the stars are fully pulled apart. In others, they're only partially disrupted. As these stars move farther from the black hole, their own gravity pulls them back together. Surprisingly, the stars that fully and partially disrupt aren't cleanly divided by mass. The Sun-like star, along with those with 0 0.15, 0 0.3, and 0.7 solar masses, survive their close encounters. But stars with 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 3, and 10 times the Sun's mass are completely torn apart. The difference between survival and destruction depends on the star's internal density. Simulations like these will help astronomers build a better picture of these catastrophic events occurring in galaxies millions of light years away. Well, hello everyone. This is Scott Roberts and Jerry Hubble here from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance. Um, we hope you guys had a great uh, holiday weekend. Uh, we got another one coming up. Uh, Explore Scientific is going to be closed on Friday. So, um, but uh, tonight we have Global Star Party and then we've got uh, programming on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, no, no um, uh, astrophotography program on Friday. So, uh, you know, so uh, Tyler gets to take a little break. Um, we recently released the latest issue of Skies Up magazine. Um, and uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting articles in it, including uh, an article that that's called Stars at Blink. And uh, you know, Jerry and his team at the Mark Slade Remote Observatory do a lot of uh, light curve type of work and stuff, uh, you know, uh, there and teach people how to do it. Um, but what did you right. make of the article, Jerry? That's a very interesting article. Uh, it was written by a young man. Let me, uh, let me pull it up. Actually, uh, he's 18. He's working with an observatory. Oh, wow. And uh, I want to show first how you can get the get the thing. Okay. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Actually, <laughs> got it set up here, but didn't. Of course, it didn't come up in the list correctly. So, let me see if it'll list it now. The heck? I guess I'll just show my whole desktop screen and go to it. Let me do that. Mm -hmm. So you see it here. There's the website. Let me let me enlarge that. So <clears throat> under the Explore Alliance on our Explore Scientific website, you'll see these different things, and then under the events and experiences, you'll see. Skies Up Global Astronomy Magazine. And that'll bring you to this page. And the issue we're talking about is this latest issue that was just released this month. And uh, in terms of the uh, the uh, article, 
And so let me let me bring up the article. Uh, so this there's a magazine. It's on it's on page sixteen, I think, which is actually page nine because this this has two two pages on each page. <laughs> so this is the article, and and uh, let me go back here. The young man's name is Gabriel Christian Niagu, an eighteen year old amateur astronomer from Romania. Uh, so that's where I'm reading this from right here, and uh, he's working. He started four years ago working at the uh, Galati Astronomical Observatory so, in Romania. So when he was 14, he's working on this. Yeah, right. Wow. Okay. So this article specifically about data that was uh, that he's a uh, as he's studying that was developed uh, through the Hipparchus uh, satellite uh, data. Yeah. And also test data and other types of data, but he starts out talking about cataclysmic variable stars, um, and he talks about uh, Tycho's nova remnant from back in uh, 1572 when Tycho Brahe. I guess his name's Tycho. We had that conversation last Hugo. week. Hugo. Hugo. Hugo yeah. Brahe. Something like that. Yeah, Chugo Bry. <laughs> Bry. Right. Bry. So, right. right, Bry. Uh -huh. So, this is the, so the supernova he observed has got this remnant now. That's what this photograph is. And he's talking about uh, different types of stars and, and a lot of similar objects were discovered in the past. Those are called cataclysmic variable stars. Uh, these are stars in which brightness increases by a large factor irregularly uh, and then drops back down to a quiescent state. And uh, <laughs> I know there's been some studies, several papers on cataclysmic variables. Uh, and I don't know if you ever met Mike. Do you remember Mike Simonson? Hmm, that rings a of bell. The, of the AAVSO. He unfortunately passed away this past year. Oh, I'm so sorry. But he was a large... Uh, he wrote some papers on cataclysmic variables. Um, he wrote quite a few papers on it. So, but as part of, and, and, and um, this young man, Gabriel, is working with the AVSO also to use their data. And uh, they've, they've got data from the Hipparchus probe and, and also their members provide data, but they've got a lot of different data in their database. Um, it looks like, um, and so the other types of variables, the one main that, that I'm interested in also is, is an eclipsing binary. Uh, uh, it's not really the star is not variable. It's just that the light curve is variable. Okay. So that's one thing to think about when you're thinking about variable stars, whether it's intrinsically variable like a cataclysmic uh, variable would would the internal structure would would change and sh and the light curve would change based on that, or if it's an external external type of variable where you have an eclipsing binary type where the the two stars overlap and the light uh, varies over time, which is what, like uh, like this uh, algol beta Cephei. Um, I think that's all. Is that algal? Got a bit. Beta Perseus is algal. Sorry. Um, and you get this very regular periodic dip in the light. Um, and so when the stars eclipse, and I'm interested in those type of stars because that's very similar to like an exoplanet uh, transit, right? So basically the two stars transit each other. And since they're so large compared to each other, you know, they're almost similar sizes that the light dip is very deep. Um, so he talks about that. And then he talks about um, another star, Alpha Ursa Minor, which is a very... <laughs> That should be a very familiar star to most everybody. It's also known as Polaris. 
Okay. So that's the oh, North yeah. Star. It's a familiar Alpha, one. Yeah. Alpha Ursa Minor is actually a... Um, um, let me see what it says here. It talks about Proxima Centauri, Alpha Ursa Minor. I guess that's like a Cepheid also. Where does he say? When he talks about that, um, that star also. Um, using the Hipparchus data. So this is what Polaris looks like. It's a very small change in brightness. It's uh, like, two, you know, 2% peak to peak. So it's a very, it's a very steady star, but it's still variable to that level. And then he talks about uh, different sources of data. Basically, he's, 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 this article is for those that are interested in becoming citizen scientists. They want to use the NASA data that's available for free out there uh, on different websites, you know, different uh, professional websites, and you can you can mine that data and and uh, find things, and that's basically what this article is about. And he talks about one of the stars that he worked with uh, another amateur astronomer. Um, her name is Melina. Thevenot using ASAS SN data. I'm not sure exactly what that stands for. But they found this variable star that has a um, um, like a uh, I'm trying to say it's got like a glow around it. It's like a nebula glow, a nebula glow around it. And uh, this is what it looks like here. Can zoom up on that a little bit, probably. No, this is the star, this variable that they found that's got this glow around it. And they're studying, they're studying that, that object to see what the, uh, what the history of it is. So that's kind of cool. So this is one of the articles that, I mean, Scott, you can talk about how these articles are are produced uh, and how they yeah, yeah. are you know, solicited. Sure. Well, uh, the, th this, is, uh, this was an idea that uh, we developed a few years ago with David Levy to create an online magazine uh, that would have contributors initially from uh, mostly from North America. Uh, but, um, and then it went, uh, you know, uh, the magazine kind of, uh, uh, fell into, um, you know, to a point where it was not published anymore. And Dr. Marcello Souza down in Brazil asked if he could uh, get involved in Resurrect Magazine, which I was very happy um, uh, that he was interested in doing that. And so uh, Marcello's got contacts with astronomers and uh, youth in astronomy from all over the world. And um, so he coordinates uh, much of the article collection of this. Uh, this is also uh, supported by David Levy. And, um, and then uh, through resources here at Explore Scientific, we assemble the magazine and publish it. Um, it's uh, under the, uh, you know, the umbrella of the Explore Alliance. It's a, you know, free to the public um, uh, magazine. And so we have, you know, current issues and past issues. Um, it has star maps from Will Tyrion in it. Um, it's got, I mean, really top notch, uh, um, you know, uh, participants that are in it. And um, so we're, you know, we're real pleased to publish it and to get that kind of information out, especially something like this. This is uh, you know, right. got a young astronomer who's really getting involved in science. And um, uh, so it's, I think it's fantastic. And, um, you know, we're not chopping down um, too many trees when we make this magazine. So no, it's uh, got an excellent set of charts in the back, like you said here. Right. Yeah. And we publish and then... also the, uh, a lot of the photography that's submitted to us um, uh, through the, uh, 
astrophotography contests and and you know and otherwise uh, if you look at the cover uh the cover is from adrian bradley who participates a lot on the global star party showing his nightscape images yeah so that's that's his yeah that was i think taken at texas star or excuse me the Okie tech star party oh okay yeah so really amazing uh, milky way shot that he did uh, he'll be on tonight on Global Star Party to show more of his nightscape work. So there's a pretty good diverse uh, selection of articles every every issue that uh, covers a lot of territory, I think. And then you've got other things, um, you know, the standard the standard um, things that are in every or every issue, like the gallery uh, of submissions. That people put in then the uh then the star charts also every time mm -hmm. yeah uh we might start putting in southern hemisphere star charts too these are northern hemisphere charts um so you know if you guys uh, uh you know we start getting a uh, request for that we'll uh we'll reach out to will terry and see if we can get some new charts made or additional charts made so you can see the detail here of the chart yeah it's not bad i mean it's all constellation right you know, uh with some deep sky objects in it but um it helps you get around yes yep and i think they're beautiful oh yeah oh, well, that's cool. a yeah that's a magazine um i wanted to go to um The uh, just just for everybody's uh, about this specific article, the AVSO uh, website is if you want to get started in the variable star observing, they're a great organization. They're the world's leader and you know in variable star observing, basically for amateurs and for professionals. Uh, you know, they they take data, visual observations and and telescope and photog uh, you know photometry uh, with telescopes data also, and uh, they have a great re they got great resources. They've got uh, training programs. They've got uh, examples that you can plot a light curve, uh, you know that type of thing. So, for example. Let's, let's go to Polaris. Let's see if we can find it here. Not sure. See. Jerry, you guys are regular contributors to the AAVSO, right? Uh, we have contributed in the past. Myron does some work in that. I've done, I've actually, when I started with the AVSO, I've done a few visual observations, but we've got a, a vast catalog of images that we haven't gone through still we've got you know myron's done quite a few observations and contributed but we've got thousands of photographs that we could mine just like what gabriel did to mine the nasa data we've got tons of data that we can mine also at the msro for variable star measurements um so that's it's kind of cool we've got this wealth of data we just don't have enough time and people to, to do all the mining. It's a, you know, that's the thing about gathering a lot of data. Uh, it just takes a lot of work to process it. And then of course we could build automation to do that. Uh, but again, it takes time and effort to do the automation uh, to do that also. Right. So that's the AVSO.org if you're interested in, in learning that. They've got, uh, they've got great uh, resources for variable stars observing. Right. Well, great. So um, uh, I guess that leads us to talk a little bit about uh, Global Star Party. Uh, we've got a pretty good lineup, uh, as we always do. Um, one of the uh, newest um, members that, that I might have mentioned a little bit earlier is uh, Cheyenne Smith. Cheyenne is actually pretty close to us. She's uh, 
uh, in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and she is a NASA solar system ambassador. Um, she's new to Global Star Party, and she'll be talking about uh, her outreach activities and the uh, mobile observatory, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but also joining us will be uh, uh, Dave Eicher, um, who uh, has been gone for a while. He went down to uh, Antarctica uh, and uh, to see the eclipse. Uh, he's been, uh, you know, gone for several weeks. So it's it's been it's nice to have him come back. Um, uh, we've got uh, um, Adrian Bradley uh, joining us. Um, of course, Jerry Hubble, um, Tyler Bowman, uh, Caesar Brollo comes back on. He missed the last Global Star Party, but uh, he'll be on. Nico, Nico the Hammer has got. Uh, he said uh, it's complicated this time, but uh, anyways, he said he'd be watching in the audience, which is cool. Um, and um, a couple of others, uh, you know. So I'm I'm trying to go from memory here, but. Uh, uh, it will uh, come on at 6 p.m. Central. And um, so, uh, you know, we hope that you tune in during that time. Uh, we had, uh, you know, a uh, great launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. And, you know, I don't know if it's, has it already, do you know, Jerry, has it started on furl? It's, it's, um, it's the next, uh, I think it's in the next day it'll start. They're unfurling because it's after it's on the third or it's almost the fourth day, I think, is when it starts. And it's been three and a half days now. So I think it's okay. in the next next day, it'll start un, uh, unfurling the sun shield. And yeah. it's going to take it's going to take a week probably for that. A whole uh, week. I know it's the whole thing's supposed to take two thing? weeks. Yeah, I think the whole wow. thing's supposed to take two weeks. And then um, and then, of course, people I've seen questions. Even within our own club, some of the chatter people are wondering. You know, we're it just passed the moon here earlier today, okay. or early in the morning. I think it's it's almost it's three hundred thousand miles away now. The moon is two hundred fifty thousand miles away, but it's it's already it's thirty percent, thirty two percent on the way to the L two Lagrange point, right? So, wow. but so why does it take another four and a half or three and a half weeks to get there? That's because we got it's it's got an initial push, right? Okay. And then it's got the gravity well of the Earth slowing it down continuously. Oh, uh, it's dragging. So it they back. only right. So they only they only burn enough fuel to get it right there, and then it's supposed to and then it's supposed to be trapped there, I guess you could say. Okay. And they got to reorient the orbit so that it's orbiting the Lagrange point. Yeah, I, I saw. So they don't they don't push like it loops. Right. So think about it. If you wanted to get there in a week, you'd have to overspeed. Right. And then you'd have to put your brakes on really hard. You'd have to turn around and put a bunch of fuel. Right. So that's not how it works. That's right. So the initial thrust gets it way past the moon, gets it 30 to like today is 30 percent there. So uh -huh. It's going to take another 90 percent of the time to get the rest of the way there. Uh, to get another seven. I see. So it's just going to it gets a big boost and then. Yeah. I guess with gravity and still its momentum, it's it's like throwing down, a ball slowing down, right. slowing so down until it just gets there. Right. So it's almost like you're throwing a ball up in the air, right? And it slows down, it slows down, and then it starts right. stops, and that's where it gets captured. Right. But it's still in Earth's gravity. That's what people don't quite understand. Huh. So even when it gets L two, it's going to be with Earth's gravity is still going to have an influence, but well, it orbits the sun, right? Well, it orbits the sun, but remember the Lagrange point is like a, it's like a quiet zone for gravity, I guess you could call it, where the pull, it's it's in parallel with the earth and the sun pulling it, right? So it's going fast enough to keep it out there, but it's in the earth, it's in the orbit around the sun. But okay. again, it's captured there because the earth is capturing it instead of it going uh, slower than the earth because it's further out like Mars does. Okay. It's going to stay with Earth because the Earth's dragging it along. I see. And it stays in line with the sun and the Earth. So that's kind so of the even way Even at works. a million miles out, Earth's gravity still has influence. It's, right. Absolutely. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Because I thought, you know, that once, well, it was true. I mean, when, when they were flying to the moon, they would get to a point where now the moon is dragging them in, right? So right now, yeah, they get close enough to the moon to go into orbit around the moon, 
and then yeah. they just do a little burn to get out of the orbit and then and then fall back to earth basically they fall back remember you can see and fall back right that's what you're doing <laughs> what a ride i mean can you imagine the right. getting the the actual real feel of what it was like to be on apollo the apollo missions and in that little capsule and just uh you know right. seeing so they, all that you know the fire around you and everything as you're coming in i mean it's just it's, it's basically I mean, like once a, you commit well, you're you're committed right, right? you can't right. like uh, okay let's start all over again i don't like no, this. but it's like a ballistic trajectory it's like it's just like a a bullet like in the ori original uh what was that movie called that black and white original movie by uh from uh from the earth mm -hmm. to the moon or something mm -hmm. that showed them firing it out of a cannon and the bullet went there to the moon right so it's kind of like that where it's just a ballistic it's a ballistic uh or orbit almost it just fires it straight to where the moon's going to be cannon. Boom. it's right. a cannon it pushes out there and then it gets there and slows down and slows down and slows down and gets right at the moon and then it gets captured <laughs> Crazy. Now, if the moon, now if the moon wasn't there right it'd be just a return it's what it's called a free return at orbit so it gets out there slows down and falls back to earth and gets back up to seven uh 20 some thousand miles per hour i think it's like twenty four thousand miles per hour and then it has to has to enter the Earth's atmosphere and burn that off. That's what the Apollo uh, capsule did. That's just nuts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's some conversation in chat about uh, a possible refueling mission for J West, but I don't know that. You know, they would I, have had to I, build in. Uh, they would have had to build in the infrastructure for that on the satellite to be able to connect up to it and and refuel it somehow like the little door like that's on the side of my yeah, like truck a, exactly like a fuel like a fuel thing or an electrical charger or whatever you know if oh, okay be... <laughs> for your tesla or whatever yeah right it's got to be uh yeah they'd have to have some kind of cell i mean they could do that for sure i'm sure they could I'm uh sure they but could. uh that'd be kind of an interesting uh task right well, you never know. I mean, it's got 10 years of fuel, maybe a little bit more if they're real careful with it, you know, so. Have you seen the, what, uh, what we'll have in 10 years, you know, so. Have you seen the new, uh, the telescope that comes after the James Webb, the, the huge version of the James Webb? The huge version of the James yeah, Webb? Yeah, no, there's a I'm larger version saying. of that, that they're going to, it's called the Lavoir. Same I kind think. of style and everything? Yep, with exactly. Wow. Except it's a uh it's supposed to be an eight meter. I think so. Will they build it in house. space or are they gonna build it on the ground? No, and try I think it's gonna be the same way. I think they're just gonna have a larger bearing right. to hold Crazy. the thing. It's called Lavoir L L A um, what is it? L E V U O Y R. It's a it's an acronym, but it sounds like a French word. Hmm. Look up look up uh success. Uh let me let me see if I can successor. Find it. Successor to JWST. After web, scientists make the case. Okay. Proposed yeah. flagship. Uh, God, I mean, it's not even unfolded yet, guys. I know. <laughs> and they're already going, I want to, we want to build it. It's like you one. bought the car. Okay. You haven't even popped open the hood yet. And you're already looking at the next car. Right. Right. Can you bring, can you share the picture of it? Yeah, hold on. Let's see. Uh, after web, this is on space.com. The pirate telescope? No, uh -uh, it's Levar. Uh, it's called okay. LA, One LA of the VOI. strongest contenders to the, is the large L or large UV optical infrared survey scope. Uh, yes. Proposed multi wavelength observatory with the ability to characterize exoplanets, study galaxy formation and evolution, and examine the early universe with a primary mirror of 30 to 45 feet. Yikes. Yeah, it's like, right, it's like eight meters or something. Oh, here's a picture. Let me, let me show you. Got this. one? Yeah, I think. Where's it at? It compares this to the, to the, 
Hubble and the JWST. So let and JWST me, let me, just looks like a little tinker toy or something. Compared. Let me let me, uh, let me bring it up here. Uh, share. All right, there it is. Wow. Oh, that's the mirror. Jeez. Yeah, that's the mirror. And then there's another picture here. Let me go back. And so there it is right there. <laughs> Man. Now look how big the sun shield is on that thing. Okay. Yeah, that looks like a football field or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not a tennis court anymore. It's a football field. The city block. Yeah. <laughs> so that's well, the next one. I, you know, I'm kind of in favor, though, of building one on the moon, you know? I think that ought to be the next one. I think it seems like they could deploy it on the moon uh, a lot more, um, uh, a lot more reliably, I guess I could say. Mm -hmm. It's it, it might be easier. It might not be easier. It depends on, by that time, we should be on the moon, I would think. Yeah, I'm sure we will. I'm sure we and, will. Uh, and actually, we'd have to be on the, um, I guess it doesn't matter what side we deploy it on. Other than if it's a radio telescope, it'll be on the back side because you want to shield the radio telescope from right from the Earth, right? With I think all the they radio do traffic. An optical and a radio telescope out the there. The optical could be on the near side first. Uh, take a one kilometer or two kilometer crater. Yeah, but think about just, think about the the temperature changes. I mean, how would they? How do you think they would protect? Um, that just have to be built in the materials that they build it out of. It have to be be able to stand because there's no way to keep it shielded from the sun, right? No. Unless you're on the North Pole or the South Pole, and that's where they plan on going. So they could build they could build an okay. optical telescope that's that's shaded all the time uh, yeah. from the light of the sun. That way, it would maintain get more data that way i would think yeah that would be a good place that actually would be a better place to deploy a, an optical mm -hmm. telescope you could keep all your instruments cold and right and, uh, yeah interesting times we live in yeah and think about having a, a a large observatory on the south pole of the moon like they have on in in hawaii on top of the mountain you got like 10 20 different telescopes on the South Pole or the North Pole. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be pretty wild. So and then you, go, you have to go and I, you I learn. I think space operations SB on the moon and Mars. Mark and Mike too, says yeah. that dust is a problem for the moon for optical telescopes. That's true. That is a dirty, dusty yeah. place. Yeah. You know, if yeah, you've you ever have to have to, some kind of dust shield. Yeah. Or materials that repel dust somehow. Maybe they can like shake it or something and the right. dust would fall off. I don't know. Yeah, but you'd have static and everything else, electrostatic problems. And mm -hmm. Richard Gray says the mount could hold so much more weight on the moon. That's also true. We could have a massive, super massive telescope up there, you know. Well, well, we'll see. I'm sure they'll put one up there for sure. I'll well, donate sure. one from Explore Scientific so they can go test. Okay. Well, I'm sure they'll be bringing along smaller telescopes to use on the moon when they first yeah, go for this too. for the surveys. Yeah, I'm sure they'll get you know half a meter telescopes. They'll be maybe it's maybe it'll be a Dobsonian. Maybe with some will. instruments on it. Yeah, I got a 20 inch. You know. Yeah, you could put a 20 a 20 inch for astronaut use. That's got everything instrumented and. In, you know, remote control and everything. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, we we had um, developed a 20 inch telescope and they, it was such a slow mover for such a long time. And recently they've been selling off. So oh, good. I think people are getting ready to do a lot of deep sky work or something. So maybe the maybe J West is inspiring them. You know, I remember being just super inspired um, by just the idea of looking through a large aperture telescope at galaxies, you know, uh, oh, yeah. from uh, Timothy Ferris's book, The Red Limit, you know, that really got me going. But, uh, and I want one of those scopes for myself, but it looks like I'm, 
I'm uh, going to be waiting uh, for a while until I'll get in line. We'll have to we'll have to come up with an, some new innovations on how to build these mirrors a lot cheaper for to be able to get more people can you buy them? Right. I don't know what kind of technology we could apply to build large. Just spin years. cast it. Spin cast it right somehow <laughs> that um, that's very fast. That's made of some <laughs> material. Maybe three D print. Right. So Tarek is telling me, I told you, Scott, change that yellow color and I will think about your 20 inch model. All right, Tarek, here's the deal. You tell me what color and I'll and put a down payment and I'll pay, I'll, I'll paint it we'll any color paint. you want. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's not like, you're not like uh, uh, Ford when he first made his Model T. You can have it in any color you like, as long as it's black. As long as you like black. <laughs> <laughs> Right. You can have it yeah. any color you like as long as it's yellow. Right. <laughs> well, no, I'm sure you can, right. we can paint it for him. Yeah, we'll paint it for you. That's easy. Um, so, uh, but uh, we should probably wrap up the show. Uh, Jerry, we got, I got to get ready yep. for Global Star Party. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in this afternoon, and we will see you at six o'clock central. So, Keep looking up, everyone. COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective at protecting you from COVID-19, especially severe illness and death. Vaccinated people are far less likely to be hospitalized or die because of COVID-19, including the Delta variant. COVID-19 has a much harder time spreading in a vaccinated population. When more people are vaccinated, we are all better protected against COVID-19. Even if you're young and healthy, it's still important to get vaccinated. Vaccines can help end this pandemic. To get the most protection, make sure you get all recommended doses of a COVID-19 vaccine. Getting vaccinated helps protect you and others from COVID-19.